Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today at the Caribou Public Library for our chapter book story time. I'm Miss Erin and I'm so glad that you're joining us. We get to start a new book today. So I chose Mary Poppins by P.L. Travers and the illustrations are by Mary Shepard. So we this large, huge book is actually um, a compendium of the four Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins comes back. Mary Poppins opens the door and Mary Poppins in the park. I'm just planning on reading the first one, um, which is only that much of this entire large <laughs> book. So we'll go ahead and get started here. Mary Poppins by P.L. Travers. All right, Let me grab my glasses. Chapter one is called East Wind. If you want to find Cherry Tree Lane, all you have to do is ask the policeman at the crossroads. He will push his helmet slightly to one side, scratch his head thoughtfully, and then he will point his huge white gloved finger and say, first to your right, second to your left, sharp right again, and you're there. Good morning. And sure enough, if you follow his directions exactly, you will be there right in the middle of Cherry Tree Lane, where the houses run down one side and the park runs down the other, and the cherry trees go dancing right down the middle. If you're looking for number 17, and it is more likely, more than likely that you will be, for this book is all about that particular house, you will find it very, you will very soon find it. To begin with, it is the smallest house in the lane, and beside that, it is the only one that is rather dilapidated and needs a coat of paint. But Mr. Banks, who owns it, eh, said to Mrs. Banks that she could have either a nice, clean, comfortable house for four ch or <laughs> for four children, but not both, for he couldn't afford it. And after Mrs. Banks had given the matter some consideration, she came to the conclusion that she would rather have Jane, who was the eldest, and Michael, who came next, and John and Barbara, who were twins, and came last of all. And so it was settled, and that was how the Banks family came to live at number 17, with Mrs. Brill to cook for them, and Ellen to lay the tables, and Robertson, I, to cut the lawn, and clean the knives, and polish the shoes. And Mr. Banks always said, to waste his time and my money. And of course, besides, these were Katie Nana, who doesn't really deserve to come into the book at all, because at the time I am speaking of, she had just left number 17. Without your leave or a word of warning. Hmm. And what am I to do? said Mrs. Banks. Advertise, my dear, said Mr. Banks, putting on his shoes. And I wish Robertson A. would go without a word of warning, for he has again polished one boot and left the other untouched. I shall look very lopsided. That, said Mrs. Banks, is not the least importance. Not of the least importance. You haven't told me what I'm to do about Katie Nana. I don't see how you can do anything about her since she has disappeared, replied Mr. Banks. But if it were me, I mean I, well, I should get somebody to put in the morning newspaper the news that Jane and Michael and John and Barbara Banks, to say nothing of their mother, require the best possible nanny at the lowest possible wage and at once. Then I should wait and watch for the nannies to queue up outside the front gate, and I should get very cross with them for holding up the traffic and making it necessary for me to give the policeman a shilling for putting him to so much trouble. Now I must be off. Phew, it's as cold as a North Pole. Which way is the wind blowing? And as he said that, Mr. Banks popped his head out of the window and looked down the lane to Admiral Boom's house at the corner. This was the grandest house in the lane. And the lane was very proud of it because it was built exactly like a ship. There was a flagstaff in the garden and on the roof was a gilt weathercock shaped like a telescope. Ha, said Mr. Banks, drawing in his head very quickly. Admiral's telescope says east wind. I thought as much. There is frost in my bones. I shall wear two overcoats. And then he kissed his wife absentmindedly on one side of her nose and waved to the children and went away to the city 
Now, the city was a place where Mr. Banks went every day, except Sundays, of course, and bank holidays. And while there, he sat on a large chair in front of a large desk and made money. All day long, he worked, cutting out pennies and shillings and half crowns and three penny bits. And he brought them home with him in his little black bag. Sometimes he would give some to Jane and Michael for their money boxes. And when he couldn't spare any, he would say, the bank is broken. And they would know he hadn't made much money that day. Well, Mr. Banks went off with his black bag and Mrs. Banks went into the drawing room and sat there all day long, all day long, writing letters to the papers and begging them to send some nannies to her at once as she was waiting. And upstairs in the nursery, Jane and Michael watched at the window and wondered who would come. They were glad Katie Nana had gone, for they had never liked her. She was old and fat and smelled of barley water. Anything, they thought, would be better than Katie Nana, if not much better. When the afternoon began to die away behind the park, Mrs. Brill and Ellen came to give them their supper and to bathe the twins. And after supper, Jane and Michael sat at the window watching for Mr. Banks to come home and listening to the sound of the east wind blowing through the naked branches of the cherry trees in the lane. The trees themselves, turning and bending in the half light, looked as though they had gone mad and were dancing their roots out of the ground. There he is, said Michael, pointing suddenly to a shape that banged heavily against the gate. Jane peered through the, the gathering darkness. That's not daddy, she said, it's somebody else. Then the shape, tossed and bent under the wind, lifted the latch of the gate and they could see that it belonged to a woman who was holding her hat on with one hand and carrying a bag in the other. As they watched, Jane and Michael saw a curious thing happen. As soon as the shape was inside the gate, the wind seemed to catch her up into the air and fling her at the house. It was as though it had flung her first at the gate, waited for her to open it, and then had lifted and thrown her, bag and all, at the front door. <laughs> Here she is walking down the the sidewalk up to the front door, holding on to her hat. The watching children heard a terrific bang, and as she landed, the whole house shook. <gasps> How funny, I've never seen that happen before, said Michael. Let's go and see who it is, said Jane. And taking Michael's arm, she drew him away from the window, through the nursery and out onto the landing. From there, they always had a good view of anything that happened in the front hall. Presently, they saw their mother coming out of the drawing room with a visitor following her. Jane and Michael could see that the newcomer had shiny black hair. Rather like a wooden Dutch doll, whispered Jane, and that she was thin with large feet and hands and small, rather peering blue eyes. You'll find that they are very nice children, Mrs. Banks was saying. Michael's elbow gave a sharp dig at Jane's ribs. And that they have no, oh, that they give no trouble at all, continued Mrs. Banks, uncertainly, as if she herself didn't really believe what she was saying. They heard the visitor sniff, as though she didn't either. Now, about references, Mrs. Banks went on. Oh, I never make a rule, oh, I make it a rule never to give references, said the other firmly. Mrs. Banks stared. But, but I thought it was usual, she said. I mean, I understood people always did. Hmm. A very old-fashioned idea to my mind, Jane and Michael heard the stern voice say. Very old-fashioned. Quite out of date, as you might say. Now, if there was one thing Mrs. Banks did not like, it was to be thought old-fashioned. She just couldn't bear it. So she said very quickly, Very well, then. We won't bother about them. I only asked, of course, in case you er, required it. The nursery is upstairs. And she led the way toward the staircase, talking all the time, without stopping once. And because she was doing that, Mrs. Banks did not notice what was happening behind her. But Jane and Michael, watching from the top landing, had an excellent view of the extraordinary thing the visitor now did. Certainly, she followed Mrs. Banks upstairs, but not in the usual way. 
With her large bag in her hands, she slid gracefully up the banisters and arrived at the landing at the same time as Mrs. Banks. Such a thing, Jane and Michael knew, had never been done before. Down, of course, for they had often done it themselves, but up? Never! They gazed curiously at the strange new visitor. Well, that's all settled then. A sigh of relief came from the children's mother. Quite, as long as I'm satisfied, said the other, wiping her nose with a large red and white bandana handkerchief. Why, children, said Mrs. Banks, noticing them suddenly, what are you doing here? This is your new nurse, Mary Poppins. Jane, Michael, say how do you do? And these, she waved her hand at the babies in their cots, are the twins. Mary Poppins regarded them steadily, looking from one to the other as though she were making up her mind whether she liked them or not. Will we do, said Michael. Michael, don't be naughty, said his mother. Mary Poppins continued to regard the four children searchingly. Then with a long, loud sniff that seemed to indicate that she had made up her mind, she said, I'll take the position. For all the world, as Mrs. Banks said to her husband later, as though she were doing us a single honor. Perhaps she is, said Mr. Banks, putting his nose round the corner of the newspaper for a moment and then withdrawing it very quickly. When their mother had gone, Jane and Michael edged toward Mary Poppins, who stood still as a post with her hands folded in front of her. How did you come? Jane asked. It looked just as if the wind blew you here. It did, said Mary Poppins briefly, and she proceeded to unwind her muffler from her neck and to take off her hat, which she hung on one of the bedposts. As it did not seem as though Mary Poppins were going to say any more, though she sniffed a great deal, Jane too remained silent. But when she bent down to undo her bag, Michael could not restrain himself. What a funny bag, he said, pinching it with his fingers. Carpet, said Mary Poppins, putting her key in the lock. To carry carpets in, you mean? No, made of. Oh, said Michael. I see, but he didn't quite. By this time, the bag was open and Jane and Michael were more than surprised to find it was completely empty. Why, said Jane, there's nothing in it. What do you mean, nothing? demanded Mary Poppins, drawing herself up and looking as though she had been insulted. Nothing in it, you say? And with that, she took out from the empty bag a starched white apron and tied it round her waist. Next, she unpacked a large cake of sunlight soap, a toothbrush, a packet of hairpins, a bottle of scent, a small folding armchair, and a box of throat lozenges. Jane and Michael stared. But I saw, whispered Michael, it was empty. Hush, said Jane and Mary Poppins took out a large bottle labeled one teaspoon to be taken at bedtime. A spoon was attached to the neck of the bottle and into this Mary Poppins poured a dark crimson fluid. Is that your medicine? inquired Michael, looking very interested. No, yours, said Mary Poppins, holding out the spoon to him. Michael stared. He wrinkled up his nose. He began to protest. I don't want it. I don't need it. I won't. But Mary Poppins' eyes were fixed upon him, and Michael suddenly discovered that you could not look at Mary Poppins and disobey her. There was something strange and extraordinary about her, something that was frightening, and at the same time, most exciting. The spoon came nearer. He held his breath, shut his eyes, and gulped. A delicious taste ran down his mouth. He turned his tongue in it. He swallowed, and a happy smile ran round his face. Strawberry ice, he said ecstatically. More, more, more. But Mary Poppins, her face as stern as before, was pouring out a dose for Jane. It ran into the spoon, silvery, greeny, yellowy. Jane tasted it. Lime juice cordial, she said, sliding her tongue <clears throat> deliciously over her lips. But when she saw Mary Poppins moving toward the twins with the bottle, Jane rushed at her. Oh, no, please. They're too young. It wouldn't be good for them. Please. Mary Poppins, however, took no notice, but with a warning, terrible glance at Jane, tipped the spoon toward John's mouth. 
He lapped it up eagerly, and by the few drops that were spilt on his bib, Jane and Michael could tell that the substance in the spoon this time was milk. Then Barbara had her share, and she gurgled and licked the spoon twice. Mary Poppins then poured out another dose and solemnly took it herself. Rum punch, she said, smacking her lips and corking the bottle. Jane's eyes and Michael's popped with astonishment, but they were not given much time to wonder, for Mary Poppins, having put the miraculous bottle on the mantelpiece, turned to them. Now, she said, spit spot into bed, and she began to undress them. <laughs> they noticed that whereas buttons and hooks had needed all sorts of coaxing from Katie Nana, for Mary Poppins, they flew apart almost at a look. In less than a minute, they found themselves in bed and watching by the dim light from the nightlight, the rest of Mary Poppins' unpacking being performed. From the carpet bag, she took out seven flannel nightgowns, four cotton ones, a pair of boots, a set of dominoes, two bathing caps, and a postcard album. Last of all came a folding camp bedstead with, with blankets and eiderdown complete. And this she set down between John's cot and Barbara's. Jane and Michael sat hugging themselves and watching. It was all so surprising that they could find nothing to say. But they knew, both of them, that something strange and wonderful had happened at number 17, Cherry Tree Lane. Mary Poppins, slipping one of the flannel nightgowns over her head, began to undress underneath it as though it were a tent. Michael, charmed by this strange new arrival, unable to keep silence any longer, called to her. Mary Poppins, he cried, you'll never leave us, will you? There was no reply from under the nightgown. Michael could not bear it. You won't leave us, will you? He called anxiously. Mary Poppins's head came out of the top of the nightgown. She looked very fierce. One more word from that direction, she said threateningly. I'll call the policeman. I was only saying, began Michael meekly, that we hoped you wouldn't be going away soon. He stopped, feeling very red and confused. Mary Poppins stared from him to Jane in silence, and then she sniffed. I'll stay until the wind changes, she said shortly, and she blew out the candle and got into bed. That's all right, said Michael, half to himself and half to Jane. But Jane wasn't listening. She was thinking about all that had happened and wondering. And that is how Mary Poppins came to live at number 17, Cherry Tree Lane. And although they sometimes found themselves wishing for the quieter, more ordinary days when Katie Nana ruled the household, everybody, on the whole, was glad of Mary Poppins' arrival. Mr. Banks was glad because, as she arrived by herself and did not hold up the traffic, he had not had to tip the policeman. Mrs. Mrs. Banks was glad because she was able to tell everybody that her ch children's nurse was so fashionable that she didn't believe in giving references. Mrs. Brill and Ellen were glad because they could drink strong cups of tea all day in the kitchen and no longer needed to preside at nursery suppers. Roberts and I was glad too because Mary Poppins had only one pair of shoes and those she polished herself. But nobody ever knew what Mary Poppins felt about it for Mary Poppins never told anybody anything. <laughs> That's the end of chapter one. Here is a picture of the children. Jane, Michael, and the twins, the babies with the carpet bag in the middle. <laughs> All right, well, we'll continue on with chapter two next time. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you then. <laughs> Bye.